Now, Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Roma Wines present Suspense. Tonight, Roma Wines bring you Mr. Vincent Price as star of The Name of the Beast. A suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Roma Wines by William Spear. Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness and entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now a glass full would be very pleasant. As Roma Wines bring you Vincent Price in a remarkable tale of... Suspense! News and views in the world of art. Yesterday at the Deauville Galleries, a record-breaking crowd attended one of the most sensational exhibitions of recent years. Masterpiece of the show is a portrait by James Dorrance titled The Name of the Beast. It's a savagely candid work a face from which violence has shattered the last vestige of humanity. The tragic circumstances of the artist's death are too well known to review here. But at the same time, one cannot help speculating upon the essential mystery surrounding this remarkable canvas. What is the name of the beast? The name of the beast was Krebs, Elmer Krebs. I found him in an evil waterfront dive, took him to my studio, and made the first sketch for the portrait that night. I gave him money, and he promised to return the next day. When he didn't show up, I went in search of him. He wasn't hard to trace. My search came to an end in a squalid room of a waterfront hotel. Come in. He didn't look up when I entered the room, but continued to sit there on the sagging, dingy bedstead, holding his head in his hands and gently moaning. I crossed the room and raised the blind to let in the daylight. Then I saw it. Blood. On his hands, on his shirt front, in his hair and beard. A horrible, sticky mass of blood. You didn't show up for our appointment today. I'm the painter you met last night, remember? You were going to sit for a portrait. What do you want? You want your money back? Certainly not. I want to finish my painting. I want you to come back to the studio. You must be crazy. Look here, it's very important for me to finish that painting. I'll make it worth your while. Money? I don't need money. (laughs) Not anymore. Maybe I can help you in some other way. You're in some kind of trouble, that's obvious. What business is that of yours? You'd better wake up and pull yourself together. We'll have to get rid of those clothes some way or other. Well, I'll think of some way. What happened? I told you it's none of your business. Why don't you leave me alone? I'm sick. All that blood. The first thing we must do is clean up this mess here. And get those clothes off. And the shoes, too. I'll make a parcel out of them and dump them in the river after dark. You'd better shave off that beard, too. They'll be looking for a man with a beard, you know. Who will? By the police, of course. What makes you so sure of that? I know more about you than you think I do. You're bluffing. Maybe. Maybe not. But you're in no position to take chances. For all you know, I might be a witness. I might have seen you kill... Shut up! Temper, temper. I told you I'm sick. I'm liable to do anything. It wouldn't be smart for you to do anything to me, Elmer. I'm your only hope. You know that, don't you? You lost your head. You were clumsy. To get away with murder, you need a clear head. Look at the mistakes you've made already. Blood all over you. As good as a rope around your neck. Where did you hide the loot? That's what you're after. Then it was robbery. Somewhere close by, too. Couldn't have gone far with all that blood on you without attracting attention. Well? It was in a shop, I imagine. That means they probably won't find the body till Monday What's morning. What's all this third degree? You with the police? On the contrary, Alma. I'm going to save you from the police. Huh? I told you. I want to finish painting that portrait of you. It don't make sense. All this just to paint some crazy picture. Ah, but what a picture, Elmer. I've waited 20 years to paint this picture. Everything I've ever painted has been merely the preparation for this. I've worked alone... Never exhibited a single canvas. Do you know what it is to work alone? Yeah, I know. Nobody knows your name, but one day, quite suddenly, a masterpiece explodes in the face of a jaded world. Like your murder, Elmer. 
After a life of petty crime, at last an act of yours really means something. Newspapers will headline it. The whole world will be clamoring to know your name. Exciting, isn't it? Exciting? Well, that's the way I feel about this portrait. I must finish the job. How do I know you won't take those clothes to the cops instead of dumping them? I'm taking a terrible chance walking out of here with a bundle of blood-stained clothes as it is. They'd fit me about as well as they fit you. Okay, that's fair enough. By the way, where... Where did it happen? The hot shop. Number 23, next to the alley. Was it necessary? The old to... man came in and started firing a revolver right off. I don't pack no rod. There was nothing else to do. I grabbed the fire axe off the wall. Oh, my. And I suppose the police have your fingerprints on file? Yeah, I've done time once. What did you do with the axe? Just dropped it there. I was sick, all that blood. I suppose you left nice red fingerprints all over the place. I didn't touch nothing. Maybe the window's still going out. That's the first place they'll look. And you're obviously in no condition to go back what there now. What are you now. trying to do? Buy yourself a nice murder rap? My dear fellow, any intelligent man can get away with murder if he keeps his wits about him. You ought to be very grateful to me, Elmer. I'm going to take your clumsy crime and make it into a work of art. <laughs> Suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you as star Vincent Price in The Name of the Beast by Robert Tallman. Roma Wines' presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Between the acts of Suspense, this is Truman Bradley for Roma Wines. Yesterday, a happily married friend told me one of his favorite formulas for enjoying life. He said he never eats dinner while still burdened with the pressures of a busy day. Instead, he sits down for a few minutes, takes it easy, chats with his wife, and enjoys with her a glass or two of Roma California Sherry, the perfect first call to dinner. Yes, Roma Sherry before dinner is a pleasant custom millions now share with family and friends. For Roma Sherry is a glorious golden amber wine, soft and mellow on the tongue, so inviting with its pleasing nut-like taste. Roma Sherry makes mealtime more welcome, helps you anticipate the good food to come. And when friends drop in, there is no more gracious greeting than a glass of Roma Sherry. Tomorrow night, before dinner, share Roma Sherry with your family. It costs no more to serve Roma, America's favorite wine. So insist on Roma, R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Remember, more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. And now Roma Wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Vincent Price as James Dorrance with Elliot Lewis as Krebs in The Name of the Beast, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. The shoes of the beast were just my size. I wore them when I went on my errand that night. It was fortunate I did. Getting into the place was simple. It was an old-fashioned lock, and the skeleton key to my studio fitted it perfectly. The shop bell jangled when I opened the door. I made my way quickly along the dark rows of counters to the rear of the shop. A pair of dusty portiers provided it from the back room. I pulled them, too, behind me and snapped on my flashlight. The body, or... What was left of it lay in a heap in the center of the room. The floor, well, it was lucky I hadn't worn my own shoes. There would be tracks out of that place, red tracks. The axe lay near the old man's head. I picked up the axe and carried it over to the sink. I washed off what I could and smeared out the prints with the cotton gloves on my hands. Then I made a quick circuit of the room, taking in every surface. With the wet gloves, I smeared the prints on the safe handle, the windowsill and the jimmy the murderer had so stupidly left behind him. Then I dropped the cotton gloves on the floor and left them there. No way to trace a pair of cheap cotton gloves. Now there was only one last thing to do. Walk around the block to dry the soles of those shoes and burn them in the stove when I got back to my studio. The handiwork of the beast would remain, but the name of the beast had been expunged. (laughs) 
didn't burn the shoes, nor did I throw that bundle of clothing into the river as I had first planned to do that night. No, no. This would be an authentic portrait of a murderer in the very blood-stained garments of his crime. That will be all for today, Elmer. How much longer does this go on? Until the painting is finished. You can't set a time limit on the completion of a masterpiece, you know. Uh, 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 Don't look much like me. You've forgotten. I made the first sketch before you shaved off your beard. I like this picture. Did you have to paint in all that blood? My dear fellow, no one in the world would ever recognize you as the man with the beard in this painting. I don't like this picture. I don't like staying here. Look, what about that stuff? When can I start cashing in on it? I should have thought I was paying you enough to live on. Or they'll want to get married. Well, that... What? Oh, good Lord, man. You mustn't even consider it. In the first place, I can't afford to support another person. Who's in asking you to I... support anybody? I got that stuff, haven't I? Well, I'm going to cash it in, that's all. Listen to me, Elmer. If you try to unload as much as one piece of that loot, the police will be on your tail so fast. Oh, no, my friend. That stuff has got to stay where it is for some time to come. You just say that, so I'll have to depend on you. So you can paint that lousy picture. Maybe. Oh, by the way, Elmer, I've never said anything about it before, but you never told me exactly what you did do with the loot. The suitcase, I told you. Yes, I know, in a locker at Grand Central, but where's the ticket? (laughs) That's one secret I'm keeping. Well, all right. But you will promise me not to unload those jewels. Not for a while. She keeps yet. asking me, when are we going to get married? What am I going to tell her? Oh, by the way, who is the lucky lady? Jeannie. Her name's Jeannie Baker. Hey, wait a minute, though. She don't know anything about me. Not anything. If I ever catch you talking to her. So help me, I'll kill you. <laughs> friend of Elmer's? Well, not a friend exactly. I'm afraid this will be rather a shock to you. You're very close to Mr. Krebs. Well, we're engaged to be married. What is it? Is he in some kind of trouble? Are you a detective? Well, not exactly. You see, I represent the insurance company. What insurance State company? State indemnity. Our policyholder doesn't want to prosecute, but at the same prosecute? time... Prosecute? I... Well, after all, the jewels were of considerable value. What jewels? Why, the jewels in the suitcase, in the locker at Grand Central. He did leave the ticket with you, didn't he? Oh, well, yes, but, but I mean, he didn't tell me that... Well, he did say it was valuable and he didn't want to risk losing the ticket, but... I... How did you know about it? My dear Miss Baker, we insurance investigators have ways of finding out these things. Now then, if you're a sensible young woman... And I can see that you're not only a sensible young woman, but a very beautiful one as well. Mr. Dorrance, what has he done? Well, I don't think he regarded it as a theft exactly, more of a loan in all probability. After all, his aunt was a very old lady and... You mean he stole this jewelry from his aunt? Well, I wanted to spare you those exact words if I could. Actually, the lady would prefer not to prosecute. But, of course, if we can secure the return of the property in no other way... I suppose I'd be arrested, too, as, as an accessory or something. I must say it was rather thoughtless of him to have involved you in this manner. How do I know you're what you say you are? I have credentials, of course. But I would rather take care of this unofficially, especially since this little talk with you. You're much too fine a person to be involved in a sordid affair like this. I don't even know that suitcase has any jewels in it. Then supposing we go there together and get it, Jeannie? Let's have a look. How, how are we going to... Well, I, I think I have a key here that will open it. There. <gasps> what? Those must be worth a fortune. Yes, they are, Miss Baker. Do you understand our concern? Yes. Close it up. I, I don't want to look at it anymore. I'd like to have spared you this. You understand, of course, that I wouldn't dream of prosecuting. Not now that I've met you. I don't know how to thank you, Mr. Dorrance. This... This is such a shock to me. How could he? How could he? There, there. You're not the first innocent girl to be deceived by an unscrupulous fellow like that. How did you happen to become involved with him in the first place? I I, 
dad was lonely. I, I have no friends here, and he came into the cafe where I wait to... Oh, there, there now. <laughs> you won't let anything happen to me. I promise you, I'll do anything to keep you from knowing another moment's unhappiness. <laughs> That night, I worked feverishly, like a man possessed. But as I worked, an uncanny change came over the man in the portrait. There was something about it, something that terrified and at the same time fascinated me. Yet the more I tried to make it come right, the less it really looked like Kretz. I began to regret I had had him shave his beard, in spite of the risk involved. Being clean-shaven altered a man's appearance more than I thought. But that wasn't the real difficulty. The real trouble was... Jeannie Baker. How could she ever have loved a beast like Krebs? A girl so gentle, so lovely. I tried not to think of her. But the image of Jeannie stood between me and the canvas. And the painting just would not come right. And as Krebs sat there sullenly posing for me, his eyes began to grow more and more cunning and suspicious. As though he could actually read my thoughts. He would jump up every time I laid down my brush and circle the portrait like an infuriated animal. Until finally, around four in the morning, he dropped off to snoring. I let him stay there. In the dawn light, I looked at the picture for the last time and draped the easel to shut it out of my sight. My masterpiece, for which I had become accessory after the fact of one murder and, and sowed the seeds of a second, was, I knew it now deep in my heart, a failure. I was obsessed now with only one resolve prevent the second murder, which by some instinct I knew was in Krebs' mind. At whatever cost to myself, no harm must come to Jeannie. Mr. Dorrance, I've been told that artists are full of romantic notions, and the Bureau has dealt with a number of them in this neighborhood, as you can well imagine. But... I must say that of all the pipe dreams that have been brought to me, yours is the most fantastic. Oh, but listen, Inspector, you've got to believe me. That girl's life is in danger. Yeah, we're checking on that. Now, let's check on a few other things, Mr. Dorrance. You they say that on the night of the 12th, you met this man Krebs at a place called Louis. Yes, sir. And afterwards, you went with him to your studio and made a sketch of him for a portrait. All right, so far, so good. He promised to return the following day and sit again for the painting. But he failed to show up, so you sought him out at his hotel. Now the story really becomes incredible. He tells you he's committed a ghastly murder. He's covered in blood. You offer to help him get away with the murder in order to finish the portrait. Oh, now really, Mr. Dorrance. You painters need publicity as bad as all that. But Inspector, I tell you, I have all the evidence. Where? At my studio. Where's this man Krebs? Except for the portrait you say you painted of him, I can't find a shred of evidence that he exists. Now, oh, just a minute. Yes, Sergeant. They picked up the girl. Good. Send her in. Oh, she'll tell you. She'll tell you who Krebs is. Oh, come in, Miss Baker. We won't detain you long. Miss Baker, do you know this man? I say, do you know this man? It's all right, my dear. Speak up. Yes. His name is Elmer Krebs. A few minutes later, they let me go, dismissing me as a harmless crackpot. Jeannie walked out of the station with me, clinging to my arm with solicitude, as one might act towards a beloved and mentally ill relative. Why did you do it? Elmer came to my apartment last night. He told me the whole story. But then why... He was boasting, boasting about how he's pinned the crime on you. Don't you see? Everything you've done to save him has incriminated you. The bloodstained clothes, even the, the loot. Oh, I'm tired. I don't know. Don't listen to me. He'll always be a threat to us, to our happiness. He's safe. The police don't even know he exists. They don't even know what he looks like. There's still the portrait. It's not a masterpiece, but they can identify him from it. I see. Darling, you, you didn't mind my rechristening you? You once loved a man named Krebs. And I still love a man named Krebs. Then it's all right. For that, I'd do anything. Put this in your overcoat pocket. It'll keep you safe, darling. What? Oh, no, no, I... It'll keep you safe, darling. <laughs> He was there in my studio when I got in that evening, waiting for me. I had more or less expected it. I hadn't expected to find him in such a cheerful frame of mind. 
He had pulled the drape off of the painting and was walking around it, viewing it from every angle. Hi, Dorrance. How did you get in here? Through the door. No more window jobs for me, Dorrance. A uh, picture. How about that? Got a new model, huh? What? The picture? Oh, it's no good. By the way, it's finished now. You won't need to come here anymore. No, say. I'll get you the suitcase. I suppose it'll be safe for you to cash that stuff. I already found time. the suitcase, Dorrance. Oh? Well, take it along with you, then. It's over there on the table. I opened it up. Well? Did you think I'd take it without checking on the contents? What are you talking about? What'd you do with the rocks, Dorrance? Rocks? You took the rocks, the jewelry. There's nothing left there but the settings, a pile of junk. Listen, Krebs, I swear I never opened that suitcase but once. Just after we took it out of the Wait. locker. She's in it with you. Listen, Krebs, you can think whatever you want to about me, but keep Jeannie out of it. I keep Jeannie out of it? That's a laugh. I mean what I say. Krebs, where are you going? To her place. If she has those rocks, I'm going to get them. Krebs, come back here. I've got to do. Krebs, if you go out of that door, I warn you. All right. <laughs> dragged his body inside the door and left it there. Then I dropped the revolver Jeannie had given me back in my overcoat pocket and left my studio. For the last time, as I closed the door on the room, it seemed that the face in the portrait was grinning at me in hideous mockery. I went to go straight to the police and give myself up. But I must have known in my heart that I wouldn't. Instead, I walked and my feet took me almost against my will to the house on Grove Street, the house where Jeannie lived. I had roused her from sleep, and she seemed rather cross. What's the big idea, barging in here this time of night? I had to see you, Jeannie. Well? That was an unlucky name you gave me, Jeannie. What's happened? I shot him. You gave me a murderer's name, and now I am a murderer. So you really did it? I wondered if you'd have the guts. Jeannie! Oh, Jeannie. What do you want me to do? Put on black and cry myself to death? You loved him once. Who said so? You were going to marry him. Maybe. I thought he was smart once. I said I'd marry him if he pulled a really big job. I might have kept my word, but he bungled it. What's worse, he involved me. When I found out he planted that stuff on me... You knew. You knew all the time. Oh, so what? So what? You'll get your cut. Oh, Krebs was right. You did take those stones. And I killed a man for you, to save you. What did you do with the gun? It's in my overcoat pocket. I was going to the police. Oh, you sap. Why didn't you leave the gun there? Make it look like suicide. It was, in a way, wasn't it, Jeannie? I'm Krebs now. Dorrance is dead. You planned it very nice. Oh, stop. Stop trying to be deep. It doesn't matter what your name is. Either way, you've messed it up. Anybody have a key to your place? No. And we still have time. Time for what? The body! Any intelligent person can get away with murder if he keeps his wits about him. You told Elmer that. Yes, I told Elmer that. You're scared to go back there, aren't you? Do you want me to do it for you? No. No, I'll do it. I must do it. Here. You mustn't forget your overcoat. No. No, I mustn't forget my overcoat. It'll keep me... It'll keep me safe. Goodbye, Jean. Steps. Hmm. What a shambles. Looks as if he shot this guy and then bumped himself off. Who are they? I don't know the other one. This is the guy that came into headquarters Saturday. You know, the artist. Huh? Well, there must have been something to his story after all. Uh, here's a note he left. You see. Dear Inspector, the portrait I told you about is standing on the easel facing the window so you can see it in the light. James Dorrance. Uh, I guess this must be it here. He said it identified the murderer. Is it a good likeness? Gee, I don't know. You look at it. Ah. Why, that's a woman. Yeah, it's that dame we picked up. The little waitress. Hey, but look, it's it's got men's clothes on. Bloody. And the way he's made the face all twisted and ugly. She was a good-looking kid. Yeah, she was. He must have been cracked. I guess he must have been. A thing like that makes you wonder, don't it? Yeah, a thing like that makes you wonder. <laughs> The discerning art lover will recognize Doran's painting as more than a mere portrait. It's the human soul stripped naked 
and its dark and decret, deep and secret places shown in all their morbid brooding fascination. But still one cannot help wondering, what is the name of the beast? Did the woman in the portrait exist, or was she only the creature of the artist's fevered imagination? Our only clue is in a quotation which the artist caused to be printed in the exhibition catalog. And he causeth all to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save that he had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name, that him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of man. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Before we hear again from Vincent Price, the star of The Name of the Beast, tonight's suspense play, this is Truman Bradley for Roma Wines with a tip for you men. Every wife loves surprises, little unexpected deeds that reflect thoughtfulness. So tomorrow night, boost your stock with her solve her problem of how to brighten weekend dining. Add to your own mealtime pleasure, too. Take home a bottle of delicious Roma California Burgundy. One sip will convince you both that red, robust Roma Burgundy is the perfect table mate for stews, spaghetti, or baked beans. For Roma Burgundy brings out hidden flavors, adds rare goodness to every morsel. Yes, gentlemen, Roma Burgundy can make a hero of you on two counts for being thoughtful, and for solving a mealtime problem. And Roma Wine, America's first choice, costs no more than ordinary wines. Remember, for greater dining pleasure tomorrow, take home Roma Burgundy. Insist on Roma, R-O-M-A, Roma Wine. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is Vincent Price. Next Thursday, our friend Keenan Wynn will be your star on Suspense. In what sounds like a very exciting play, which all takes place on a bus. A bus making a return trip from the state insane asylum. I know you won't want to miss it next Thursday. And now, let me add my voice on behalf of a very great and wonderful cause. The pennies, the dimes, and the dollars that you give when you buy Easter seals give crippled children their chance for happy living. Help a crippled child to walk again. Buy your share of Easter seals tomorrow. Thank you. Vincent Price appeared through courtesy of 20th Century Fox and will soon be seen in their production, Dragonwick. Next Thursday, same time, Roma Wines will bring you Keenan Wynn as star of Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Produced by William Spear for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Now, Roma Wines, R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Roma Wines present... Suspense! Tonight, Roma Wines bring you the MGM star, Mr. Keenan Wynn, as star of The Night Reveals, a suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Roma Wines by William Spear. Suspense. Radio's Outstanding Theater of Thrills is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness and entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now a glass full would be very pleasant, as Roma Wines bring you Keenan Wynn in a remarkable tale of... Suspense! Go ahead. Tell us the story, Mr. Jordan. It might help to get it out of your system. Yes. Go ahead, Harry. Well, tell it here, Marie, in front of you. Sure. I can stand it if you can. Well, all right. I'll tell it. From when I first began to know, for sure, two weeks ago, a 
should have known before that something was wrong. I should have known by her eyes. There was a queer look in them, staring at me one minute, avoiding me the next. Well, I came home late one Monday night. They were asleep, my son Johnny and my wife here, Marie. I lay in bed reviewing my day's work. You see, I'm an investigator for the Herkimer Fire Insurance Company, and while thinking about the fire on 2nd Avenue, I fell asleep. Suddenly, I was sitting bolt upright, wide awake, with a strange feeling of being alone in the room. I looked towards Marie's bed. It was too dark to see. I called. Marie? Marie? No answer. I got up and I walked to her bed. The quilt was bunched up. I pulled the covers down. The bed was empty. In the bathroom? No, she wasn't there. And not in Johnny's room either. Johnny was alone. Marie wasn't in the apartment. I put on the light. I looked at my watch. It was two in the morning. I got dressed, walked out, rang for the elevator. <laughs> it was nothing. Of course, it was nothing important. But my heart kept hammering away. Oh, morning, Mr. Jordan. Kind of late for you. Yes, to... yes. Good morning, Steve. Uh, did you see my wife go downstairs? Yeah, Mr. Jordan, about a half an hour ago, I'd say. Oh. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, did you see which way she went? Yeah, sure. She went towards uh, Third Avenue. Said she was going to the... Going to the drugstore, I guess. Yeah, that's right. There's yeah. one over on 96th Street, open all night, you know. Oh, thanks. <laughs> well, that was it. She went to the drugstore. I was worried over nothing at all. I, di I didn't know what to do quite. I, I didn't want to follow her. But the elevator boy was watching me, so I strolled easily along toward 3rd Avenue. I stood on the deserted dark corner and looked up and down the street. Then I saw her coming. She was walking toward me briskly. Harry, what are you doing here? Well, I got up and saw you were gone. I couldn't sleep. Had a dreadful headache, so I decided to go down for some aspirin. Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, the drugstore on 96th Street. But you were coming from 98th Street. I, I took a little walk, thought some fresh air would do me some good. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a nice night. I've only been gone about ten minutes. Well, Steve said you were gone about a half an There's hour. There's only ten minutes. What time is it now? 2.35. I've been out for about 15 minutes. Oh, well, it's more it than that. It was 15 minutes, no more than that. Well, uh, yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Well, everything seemed all right, but still I felt something was wrong. We got into our apartment, and we both went to bed. For a minute or so, we said nothing. Listen, hmm? a fire. A fire. Yeah. Yeah, not far. Over east a couple of blocks. By the river, I'd say. Hey, that's my district. A fire. Uh, who... Hello. Hello, Harry. Sorry to wake you in the middle of the night, but there's a bad one over near you. Between second and third. Maybe a total loss. Between second and third, Mr. Parmenter? Oh, an apartment building. Yeah. 98th Street. 340 East 98. I called you because I'd like you to go there direct first thing in the morning instead of coming to the office. Okay, I'll meet you there. Okay, Mr. Parmenter. Good night. A fire on 98th Street. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't see Marie in the dark, but I knew. I knew she was staring at me. I was very tired. Good night, Marie. Good night, Harry. For suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you a star, Keenan Wynn, with Kathy Lewis in The Night Reveals by Cornell Woolrich. Roma Wine's presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Between the acts of Suspense, this is Truman Bradley for Roma Wines. Tomorrow and Saturday, most American households will be busy with preparations for Easter Sunday dinner, the traditional feast ending the Lenten season. Time-honored accompaniment to gracious Easter dining and entertaining is wine, enjoyed throughout the ages by families and friends for pleasure and companionship in a sensible, moderate way. A fine wine 
that will add good taste and friendliness to your Easter day is Roma, the wine most Americans prefer. And most popular of all Roma wines is Roma California Sherry, a light, mellow wine of inviting fragrance and unusual nut-like taste. The centuries-old custom of sipping sherry before dinner is now more popular than ever. And today, millions of Americans, especially those who seek good living, enjoy Roma sherry before each evening meal. Yes, Roma sherry is truly America's first call for dinner. Try Roma sherry before dinner. Discover how it increases your mealtime pleasure. Get Roma sherry tomorrow, in time for the Easter weekend. Remember... That's Roma, R-O-M-A, Roma, America's favorite wine. And now Roma Wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Keenan Wynn as Harry Jordan and Kathy Lewis as his wife Marie in The Night Reveals, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Go on, Mr. Jordan. Well, gentlemen, the next morning I went over to 98th Street to inspect the remains of number 340 and to see if there was evidence of anything suspicious about the origin of the fire. And Mr. Parmenter was there. There it is. Got it. Guess we'll be paying off on this one, all right. Yeah, completely burned out. Anyone hurt? A few. No one did. Lucky they just installed the new fire escapes. Mm, just the walls left. Fire must have been quite a sight in the height of its glory. Yeah, quite a sight. Say, those walls look pretty bad. Might collapse most any time. Oh, the building will have to be raised. That fire did a good job. Oh, there's the commissioner. Oh, hello, Parmenter. Uh, Jordan? How are you, Morrell? Know anything about the fire, commissioner? No, not a thing. Well, we'll have a look. I wouldn't go in there, Jordan. Those walls... Oh, I can take care of myself. Maybe you better not go inside, Harry. Now, don't worry about me. I know fires as well as anyone. You stay outside, Mr. Parmenter. I'm going in. I walk gingerly into the black and ruined hallway... And ashes up to my ankles until I reached the remains of the stairway. Underneath were several baby carriages, just twisted pieces of metal. A burning fragment of something fell nearby. Come on back, Jordan. Oh, I'm all right. I poked around near the carriages, sifting through the fine, clean ashes. But something caught my eye. A glob of yellow metal. I picked it up and I worked my way out. Ah, she's burned through, isn't she? Yeah, clean through. Nothing left of her. Yep. Did you find anything, Harry? Oh, nothing much. Fire started in the hallway, all right. Cellar's untouched. Fire works its way up. What's that in your hand? Oh, that. Oh, it's just a piece of metal I found. Oh. Here, I just picked it up for my kid. He likes shiny things. What do you think, Commissioner? Oh, probably one of those gadgets they have on baby carriages. Yeah, I guess you're right. Yeah. is isn't anything. But it was something... I had run my fingernail across this glob of metal. It looked like gold. I would examine it in detail at home. Hello, Daddy. Well, how are you, Johnny? Mama says I was bad today. Harry, you're home early. Yeah, yeah, I got sooner. I got through sooner than I expected. And I... What is it? What is it, Harry? Your locket. You're not wearing it. You never had it off before. My locket? Well, well, I don't you remember? I... Daddy, can I go over to see Davy Taylor for a minute? Yes, yes, Johnny, go ahead. All right. Gee, thanks, Daddy. He shouldn't have done that, Harry. I didn't want him to go. He hasn't had his dinner. Never mind, Johnny. What did you say happened to the locket? Why, I gave it to you. To me? Well, I put it in your pocket to have it fixed. The catch was loose. I don't remember. I put it in your pocket, Harry. I forgot to mention it to you. I wanted you to take it to the jeweler's, get the catch fixed. I just put it in your coat pocket while you were shaving. When? Uh, yesterday. Yes, yesterday morning. Well, then it should be in my pocket now. I wore this suit yesterday, too. Nothing in my pockets, Marie. Well, uh... Marie. Yes, Harry? Is... is anything wrong with you? I'm perfectly all right. There's not a thing wrong with me. Well, you look worried, as if you had something on your mind. Oh, it's nothing. I've just been having a headache. Maybe you ought to see a doctor. No, it, it really doesn't amount to much. Well, I think I'll take another look for the locket. Uh, which suit did you say you put it in? Your your blue suit, I think. Uh, may, maybe it was the gray, though. I, I... 
couldn't make it out. What had she done with the locket? Had she pawned it? Had she given it away? And then I remembered something. I went into the bathroom and locked the door. I looked at this shapeless little glob of yellow metal. I rubbed the blackened spots away until all of it was gleaming. I took a nail file out of the medicine chest and began to file it. I kept filing until I had enlarged the crack to the full length of the piece of gold. Then I slipped the nail file inside and pried. Pried it open. Tiny fragments of glass and then... Then I saw a piece of scorched paper. It was a photograph. A picture of my son, Johnny. This glob of metal was my wife's locket. I put the locket and the picture in my pocket and walked out. All right, now. Now, what's the largest continent in the world? I know it. It's... Uh, it's Asia. Mm-hmm. And the next largest? That's easy. Africa. Full of jungle. That's where Tarzan lives. Isn't it time for Johnny to be in bed? Yes, I... I had an idea it was so late. You run along to your room, Johnny. I'll be in in a minute. All right, Mother. Good night, Dad. Good night, Johnny. Sleep well. <clears throat> he's, uh... He's getting along very well in school... Except for arithmetic. Seems to be having a little trouble. Johnny will be all right. Yes. Johnny will be all right. I know he'll be all right. I watched her. She seemed very uneasy. I walked over to my pipe rack where I kept several books of matches in a jar. But there weren't any there. All this time I knew she was watching me. Watching me closely. I looked behind the rack. There wasn't a match around. What the devil happened to all my matches? Uh, I have a match. Here, here, let let me light it for you. Did you take the matches out of the jar, Marie? Well, I... uh, Did you? Yes, I I needed them in in the kitchen. Shall I light your pipe for you? No, no, I'll light it myself. I picked a match out of the booklet. It was a clean white match with a green head. I struck it against the side... The match sputtered up into a yellow flame, fringed on the bottom with blue. Marie stared at it until I felt the sharp bite of the flame on my thumb. Would would you like a cup of tea, Harry? No. No, dear, I don't think so. Marie! Uh, Leave the matches on the table. I I need them. I'm rather short of matches. The pilot light isn't working. Is this the only book of matches in the house? I'll have to get some tomorrow. Where, where, where are you going, Harry? Get a drink of water. No, no, I'll get it for you, Harry. Never mind, Marie. I'll get it myself. I went into the kitchen. There was a paper bag alongside the gas range. Matches, all thrown in helter-skelter. Books of matches and safety matches, all mixed together. I walked back and sat down in my chair. Marie, you've been having headaches lately. I'm just tired. Nothing serious. Well, how would you like to go away for a few days? You know, take a vacation. I'll get a maid to take care of Johnny and me. It'll it'll do you a lot of good. No, no, I don't need a vacation. There's nothing wrong with me, but, Harry, there is... Yes? There's there's nothing the matter with... You were about to say something else. I've got to go into Johnny's room and see that he's covered. He always throws the covers off. I sat there, looking at the door... And then I glanced about the room. There was the pack of matches lying open on the table. I closed the cover, and my eye caught her purse lying nearby. It was bulging. Harry. Oh, well, what's the matter? My, my purse. Yeah. Yes, your purse. Here, look. See, the handle's loose. And it's full of matches. A dozen books of them. And these newspaper clippings. Give it back to me. Why are you saving these clippings? Why do you carry matches with you? I bought the matches in a store a dozen for five cents. And these clippings. Fire on 112th Street causes severe damage. And these others. Why are you saving these clippings, Marie? There's nothing wrong in that. I'm I'm interested. I'm interested in your work. I intend to keep a file on fires. It, it, It will help you in your work. That's very considerate, Marie. Oh, Harry, you're so good. Why should this have to happen to us? Towards midnight, I went to bed. Marie did not follow me. I I lay in the semi-darkness, wide awake, trying to think what I should do. I couldn't collect my thoughts. 
Every time I closed my eyes, I could see the flame of the match, yellow and blue, crawling along the matchstick. Here, drink this, Harry. It will help you sleep. What is it? It's cocoa. It's very good for you. I'm not the one that's having trouble falling asleep. Uh, we both couldn't sleep last night. I'm taking some of this myself as soon as I go to bed. All right. Leave it on the nightstand. You'll be sure to drink it while it's hot. Yes, Marie, I will. Good night, darling. Good night, Marie. Coco. And then suddenly I knew. I looked around quickly for something to pour it in. There was the radiator pan. It was empty. I poured the cup of liquid into it. And then I lay back and waited. Waited for her next move. About a half an hour later, I heard the door open softly and Marie tiptoed toward my bed. Harry? Harry? Are you asleep? I didn't answer. Just kept breathing evenly. She hovered for a moment over me and then she tiptoed out, carefully closing the door behind her. I dashed out of bed and hurried into my clothes. Quickly, I poured the liquid from the pan into a bottle and put the bottle into my pocket. Then I grabbed my coat and followed her. I rang for the elevator. She's only a few minutes headway. I'd catch up with her easily, and then... Well, then we'd have a showdown. Steve looked at me with controlled amazement. Hello, Steve. Oh. Hello, Mr. Jordan. Uh, my wife went down a moment ago, didn't she? Yeah, yeah, Mr. Jordan. Just took her down. She went toward 3rd Avenue, didn't she? I... I think so, sir. She sort of stopped for a minute, then turned toward 3rd Avenue. Uh, I had to get back to the elevator because you were ringing. Mm. When I reached the corner, I looked up and down 3rd Avenue. Then I saw her. She was walking north. I crossed to the other side of the street and followed her, keeping at a distance. At 98th Street, she turned east. Down the middle of the block was the remains of that last night's fire. She paused in front of the gutted building for a long time, just stood there, looking at it. Then she walked inside. I waited for a few seconds and then followed her. It was pitch dark in the burned-out hallway. Ahead of me, I could see the glow of a match. Then I saw what she was doing. She was collecting the charred debris near the baby carriages. How foolish. There wasn't anything, anything that could burn there now. She lit another match. I watched the flame light up her face. A face so intent upon her work that she didn't hear me approach. Marie! Who's there? It's me, Harry. Harry, why did you... Come along, Marie. We'd better get out of here. The police. I took her hand, and without a word, she came along. We walked home in complete silence. We both knew. When we came to our apartment house, I... Stopped and rang for the elevator. In the light of the hallway, I could see her face. My wife's face. Ashy gray. Her eyes bright and painful. You run upstairs, Marie. I'll be along in a minute. Harry, where are you going? I'll be right back. Please, Harry, don't... Don't do anything. You run along, Marie. You're not going to... T no, no. I'm only going to the drugstore to get something. I'll be back in a few minutes. <laughs> came home a half an hour later. She was waiting for me. Did, did you do it, Harry? Harry, please tell me. I've got to know. I had the cocoa you gave me analyzed. I'm sorry. I had to do it. Don't you see? I couldn't help it. It was very easy for the druggist, especially when I told him what I thought was in it. That sodium stuff that makes you sleep through an earthquake. Please try to understand, Harry. You must understand. Is the kid asleep? Yes, Johnny's all right. Well, I... I was sorry for Marie... She looked so haggard and worn. It wasn't her fault. I was sorry for myself. My head was roaring. I wasn't feeling too well. I kept seeing sparks in front of my eyes. I closed my eyes for a moment. Let's go to bed, Harry. Marie, we can do something. Let's burn up every match. Every match in the house. We'll never bring another match in no, here. No, no, Harry, we can't do that. You don't want to? No, Harry, not now. See? This is the first book. <laughs> It's turning black. We'll do it with every book of matches. It's no use. It's no use, Harry. Strange, isn't it, that this should happen to me? Me, a fire inspector. 
Oh, that's funny. Give me the matches, Marie. All the matches. No, I can't do that. I won't. Give them to me. Please, please don't. Please don't take them. I'll do anything you want, anything. Where did you hide them? Tell me, where are they? Inside the range behind the paper bag. I dropped her hand and she sank to the floor in a huddle, weeping. Then I went into the kitchen and I got all the matches. Please, please, Harry, don't burn them up. By now, my anger was cooling off. Look, Marie. Look up. See? I light each book of matches one at a time until they're all gone up in smoke. Yellow flame licked its way down the matches. The cover caught fire and blackened. I watched her look at the flame with dazed eyes. Listen. Listen, Harry, do you hear? It's just someone in the hall. It's more than someone. Something's happened. Something has happened. I'll take a look. The house is afire. Yes, yes, Marie. Wake up, Johnny. Johnny! Johnny! We'll have to hurry. The flames are coming up the stairs. There, there's an upward draft. What's the matter? The house is afire. The house is afire. We've got to get out. Well, it's too late to go down. We'll have to go up through the roof. Oh, oh I'm, I've hurt my leg. Come along, mother, Johnny. wait for Mother. She'll come along. No, no, I want to wait for Mother. It's all right, Johnny. Go along with Daddy. I'll follow you. <laughs> no, I won't. No, I won't. No. Hold on. Come on. Give me your hand, Johnny. Now, don't be scared. The fire won't hurt you. It won't hurt you at all. It's safe to see. We made our way upstairs very slowly because of Marie's sprained ankle. Finally, we got to the roof. There was some firemen on the next roof, about ten feet separated the two buildings. All right, don't get panicky. We'll get you off safely. We're going to have to jump across, Daddy. Mother won't be able to jump. Her foot. It's all right, Johnny. Don't be scared. Putting a board across the two roofs, we'll just walk across. All right, now. One at a time. Tie the rope around here and come across. Johnny, you go first. But don't be afraid there. The, the rope will hold you in case you slip. But, Mother, you got to go first. I'll go right after you, Johnny. Yeah, you promise. Huh? Go ahead, Johnny. Mother will follow you. No, don't turn around. Keep walking. All right, the kid's safe. Now you, lady. Oh, be careful, the board. Hey, the board slipped. Hey, honey, what are you guys get for the board? It's all right, it's all right. Your mother's going to be all right. You kid. pushed the board off, Harry. I saw you do it. No, I didn't, Marie. I didn't. All right, there it is. Okay, lady, just tie the rope around you. Don't be afraid. Don't look down. Ready? Okay, boys. There, she's all right. Now you, mister. All right. That's right. Tie the rope around you. All set. Okay. On the ground, we stood there, the three of us, watching the fire. Sparks were shooting up through the hole where it had bitten through. Great flames shot out, stabbing at the sky. The top of the roof was burning now. A red flame crawled along, searching out the inflammable spots. A wooden pole caught fire and blazed up in a long, narrow, curving arc. The wind was helping it. And all this time, Marie was shaking, shaking violently. Not with cold, I, I pitied her. And then she threw up her hands and shrieked. No, 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 darling, don't... Now, don't do it, Marie. Now, there's no need. Not, not the police. You don't know what you're saying. Hey, what, you is what is it, lady? What oh, is it? Pay no come. attention. Oh, no, 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 it's no use, Harry. Officer, officer, these awful fires, they're not accidental. There's a pyromaniac, a criminal. I know who it is. You've got to arrest the person. Arrest them. So there won't be any more. All right, lady, all right. Now, now what is this? Who's the pyromaniac? Criminal is my husband, Harry Jordan. This man here, arrest him, officer. Well, that's about all there is to the story, gentlemen. And I was brought here. Must have sounded kind of 
Well, painful for you to hear it all over again, Marie. No. It was all right, Harry. I wonder... Oh, I got a cigarette. Could I? No. I'll light it for you, Harry. <laughs> you don't have to worry. I won't try and keep the matches here. She's been awful good to me, gentlemen. You'll take care of her, won't you? She tried everything to help. She hid the matches so as to keep them from me. She even tried to give, give me sleeping pills so I wouldn't... I w it's all right, Harry. I'm sorry about the locket, dear. Must have fallen out of my coat when I was in that building at 98th Street. I... I... It's all right, Harry. You can buy me another one sometime. You can't blame anybody for liking fires. It's not their fault. Fires are beautiful to watch. So bright and clean. They burn up all the filth and dirt. And they're magnificent to watch. Especially the big ones. The way the flames roar and crackle. Lighting up everything around you. The beautiful fire. The beautiful fire. The beautiful fire. Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines. R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. As traditional as fine frocks for the Easter parade is fine wine with Easter dinner. Here's how you can enjoy this festive Easter dining custom and still keep within your budget. Serve delicious Roma California Burgundy. At the first sip, you'll discover why robust Roma Burgundy is the perfect flavor mate for your favorite roast or ham. How Roma Burgundy's taste harmony with fine foods brings out hidden flavor in every morsel. Best of all, red Roma Burgundy, with its rich, exciting color, exquisite full bouquet, and tempting taste luxury, is a treat you can enjoy often. For fine Roma wines, America's first choice, cost no more than ordinary wines. Put Roma Burgundy on your weekend shopping list now. Give your family the utmost in gracious, satisfying Easter dining. Insist on Roma, R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Keenan Wynn appeared through courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of The Postman Always Rings Twice. Next Thursday, same time, Roma Wines will bring you Nancy Kelly, a star of Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Produced by William Spear for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Roma Wines presents Suspense. Tonight, Roma Wines bring you Miss Nancy Kelly and Miss Kathy Lewis in Dark Journey, a suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Roma Wines by William Spear. Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness and entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now a glass full would be very pleasant, as Roma Wines bring you Nancy Kelly and Kathy Lewis. In the premiere of Lucille Fletcher's radio play for two actresses, Dark Journey. Tonight's study in... Suspense. Today 
I am going on a journey. I am going to see Ann Brody again after 15 years. When the news came yesterday, terrible as it was, it was as though a shadow had lifted from my life. A secret horror that I could never quite forget. I have been afraid of Ann Brody now for 15 years. But there is no need to be afraid of her anymore. Anne's secret has been locked in my heart together with all shameful, horrible things. Yet I've never gone on a journey like this one, but what it comes back. There have been times when I couldn't bear the whistle of a train flung out long and mournful over the lonely countryside. I couldn't bear the smell of a day coach, the feel of the plush seats, the rattle and bustle. Only because everything came back. Every detail of that long and terrible weekend we spent together 15 years ago. Anybody saw it, do you? No. Uh-uh. Only old Mr. Hodges is a station master, and he's no goth. I wouldn't want anybody to know. Not that I care, but you know how the tongues wag in this town. Well, it's much better to be perfectly sure of your plans before you pass the word around. Then if you and Clyde don't settle things, well, nobody will be any the wiser. <laughs> if we don't settle things, well, there's no if about it. But Clyde and I are practically engaged. Did you get his letter yet about us coming to New York? Uh-huh. Well, for goodness sake, why didn't you tell me? What'd he say? Oh, nothing much. He's, he's no letter writer, just that he was glad and that he's been busy, and he's going to call us at the hotel. Oh? He can't meet us at the train? No. Uh, it seems it's his mother's birthday, and he promised to take her to lunch in town. We'll be getting in just around that time. He's terribly devoted to her, you know, has been ever since his father died. Oh, I see you're very much in love with him, aren't you, Anne? Terribly. Yet you really see him so little. How long has it been now? Three months? Three months and six days. But it doesn't really matter. No. I know Clyde loves me and I love him. There's a bond between us. And nothing will ever break it. Well, as long as you feel that way, it's a wonderful way to feel. But I don't think you ought to let it drag on like this much longer, Anne. I really don't. <laughs> Don't worry. We'll settle it this time once and for all. You'll see. When we get on this train again, I'll be wearing his engagement ring on my finger. Probably tied up with his mother. Come on, let's go down to the drugstore and have a sandwich. Aren't you just starved? No, no, I, I don't feel hungry. You go, though. I'll wait. Oh, come on. The clerk will take the message for no, you. No, no, I I want to be here myself. Well, why don't you call him? I can't if he's at a restaurant. Well, maybe he didn't go. Maybe he's home, sick, or, or at the office. No, no, it, it wouldn't look right. He's got to call me. I... I, I don't know why he doesn't. I don't know why either. In fact, why couldn't we all have had lunch together at that restaurant? I mean, he, he's not exactly poor, is he? Uh, don't you want to take a bus ride or see the sights or anything? Later, Alice. After he's called. Hello? Yes? Oh, yes, this is Miss Ann Brody. What? He, he left a message. Oh, thank you. What is it? He stopped by and left a message. He has a previous engagement. A previous engagement? When he knew I was coming to New York this weekend only to see him. Well, maybe it was something he couldn't get out of. Maybe on account of his mother. But he birth. already gave her today. And after all, he knew I was coming. He knew I'd want to be with him every possible minute. Well, maybe that's the trouble, Anne. Maybe he doesn't want to be pinned down. Maybe you expect too much. But he was right here in the hotel, and he didn't even... Oh, he's grown away from me. He's not mine anymore. Alice, Alice, you know what Clyde has meant to me these three years, how I've lived for him and worshipped him. It's, 
Oh, it's just as though my, my world had been cut away. It's like, it's like having a lump of ice for a heart. Alice, Clyde is my heart. Oh, I, I've got to see him. I've got to tell him. Oh, Anne. Dear, wouldn't you like to lie down? No, no, I can't lie down. I'm going to sit here in, in this chair by the window. I wish you'd go, Alice. I want to be quiet. You think and think about him. And I wouldn't. Something's happened to him. There's some barrier. I've got to wish it away to break it down. What are you talking? I can do it, you know. And please go. Please. Tell me, it's nine o'clock. I didn't mean to sleep so late. We better get up and get breakfast. Alice. Alice, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? He hasn't called me. I haven't slept. Why don't you call him, man? Call him and have it out with him once and for all. No, no, I, I couldn't. Well, maybe there's something bothering him. Maybe it's some family situation. After all, his mother didn't have lunch with me yesterday. Maybe there, maybe there was a reason. What reason could there be except that she didn't want to meet me? She doesn't want him to marry anybody. She wants him all to herself. Well, isn't that enough to upset any fellow? Oh, come on. We'll get to the bottom of this thing. What's his number? I'll get it for you. I, I haven't his number. I never called him at home. But his address is 3254 Sunset Drive, Riverdale, New York. 3254 Sunset Drive, Riverdale, New York. Hello. Uh, hello, operator. This is room 351. We want to put in a call to Riverdale, New York. Uh, 3254 Sunset Drive, Riverdale, New York. Uh, the name is Dexter. Mr. Clyde Dexter. Will you get it for us, please? What did she say? She's looking at us. Uh, there it is. She's ringing. Here, you better take it now. Oh, no. No, just one minute. One minute. Let me get my breath. Let me think of what I'm going to say. Hello? Is this the Dexter residence? This is Miss Ann Brody speaking. I wonder if I might speak to Mr. Clyde Dexter, please. Thank you. Clyde? Oh, Clyde, this is Anne. Oh, I'm, I'm fine, thank you. Oh, Clyde, I've been waiting here at the hotel for you to call, and Alice and I have to spend the morning out, and we thought we'd better let you know we wouldn't be in just in case you wanted... Oh, yes, Clyde, I, I know you said you had a previous engagement, but I thought... Well, you see, Clyde, I'm only going to be here today, and... We get to see each other so little. I was wondering. What's that, Clyde? Yes. Yes. Well, no, I, I didn't. What did you say, Clyde? I, I didn't understand. You know what? You. Oh, Clyde. Oh, Clyde, it's not true. It, it can't be. But, Clyde, we. But, Clyde, you can't do this to me. I've, I've considered myself engaged to Anne, you. I... Anne, give me that phone. No. Oh, no. I just want to say goodbye to him. Please. No. Anne, don't, don't look that way. What did he say? He, he told me he's engaged to marry a New York girl this September. Oh, Anne. Well, he, he just isn't worthy of you. He couldn't have been if he treats you like this now. I love him. I love him. I love him till the day I die. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sorry. I, I'm... Oh, please, Alice, please don't talk. Don't come near me or go away, will you, just for a little while? Oh, no, I won't leave you. I can't leave you when, when you look like oh, that. Go away, I said. How do you hear me? Go away. I want to be alone. I want you to go away. I, I have work to do. Work to do? I'm, I'm going to will him to come back to me. I'm going to make him come to this hotel through heaven and hell. And they're dragging him away from me. Oh, Anne. I can do it. I've done it before. I've made him write to me. I've made him call me up out of a clear sky after months and months. I willed him to speak to me the very first time I saw him when he was just a stranger. 
I willed him to give me his fraternity pin last year at the spring dance, and I can do it. I can do it. If only I try hard enough, and and if you're absolutely quiet, Clyde, Clyde. Oh, it's no use. He's too far away. Oh, I'll have to come closer to him. We're going out. Going out? Where to? To Riverdale. Riverdale? I want to look at his house to see where he lives. There's something there. Someone who's holding him back. And let's go back to Denford. Let's take a train tonight, any train, and get out of here for good. No, I can't go home. I told you that before. I can't until I have his engagement ring on my finger. <laughs> Roma Wines are bringing you Nancy Kelly and Kathy Lewis in Dark's Journey by Lucille Fletcher. Roma Wines' presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Between the acts, this is Truman Bradley for Roma Wines with a little domestic drama. It's happened to you before and will happen again. You're relaxed in your easy chair, coat off, contentedly reading your evening paper. Your wife is probably tidying up after dinner. The doorbell rings. Sure enough, it's guests who just dropped in. Now, famed hostess Elsa Maxwell tells us how she handles these surprise visits. She says, I always keep Roma California Sherry on hand to welcome unexpected guests. Serving Roma Sherry is so simple, you just pour and hospitality reigns. And because Roma is America's favorite wine, you know your guests will enjoy it. Yes, there's no easier way to gain a reputation for gracious hospitality than by keeping Roma Sherry ready for guests. And Roma, America's taste favorite, the wine more Americans prefer, costs no more than ordinary wine. So make a note to get mellow, golden amber, Roma Sherry tomorrow. Once you try the tempting fragrance and intriguing nut-like taste of Roma Sherry, you'll always ask for Roma. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wine. Remember, more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. And now Roma Wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Kathy Lewis as Alice and Nancy Kelly as Anne. In Dark Journey, a play well calculated to keep you in suspense. It's getting dark. I don't think we ought to be wandering around here like this. There might be strange men. There's the street. Sunset Drive. And there's the house. I've seen pictures of it. I'd, I'd know it anywhere. Anywhere. Oh, Anne, please. This is doing you no good. Oh, I've dreamed about that house. Dreamed of myself and him living in it together. I've dreamed of our children playing on that lawn and the sound of music inside and our car standing outside. But it wouldn't mean a thing to you, Anne, if Clyde didn't love I've you. I've dreamed of the years we'd spend together. Why, well, I... I even named the children, Clyde Jr. and Peter and Charlotte. That's his mother's name. I never liked it, but I was going to call one child. That's just to please him. And now, what have I got? Nothing. Nothing. It's gone. Come on. Come on with me, Anne. Oh, there's a light going on up here. He pulled it to his room. I wonder if he's home. Clyde. Clyde, think of me. Come back to me. Oh, love me, Clyde. Love me. Love me. Don't, Anne, don't. Somebody might hear you. Shadow at the window. Oh, it's Clyde. Oh, no. No, it's someone else. It's a woman. A gray-haired woman. Oh, it's his mother, Alice. Clyde's mother. I don't think he's home, Anne. Let's go back to the hotel. No. 
No, I want to see her. I've heard so much about her. She always turned her nose up at me. She never admitted it, but I knew. He was the only son, and she thought there wasn't anybody good enough. And, and he was always under her influence, just believed everything she said. I could tell the way he talked. It was always mother says this and mother says that. I bet it was she who turned him against me who picked out that, that New York girl. Oh, Anne, please, come on. You're just tearing your heart She's out. She's up in his room now. She's straightening his thing. She's happy up there. She doesn't care that she's made me miserable. Oh, I can feel it now, Alice. I can feel the barrier in my heart. Oh, yes. Something's coming. Let's go. We're doing no harm. We can stare, can't we, if we wish? Come on. Come on, we'll walk past the house. We'll defy her. We'll go up and ring the bell. And, and then when she comes down to answer it, we'll ask, Is Mrs. Clyde Dexter at home? And then when she asks us who we mean, we'll laugh at her face. Oh, Anne, you're, you're just beside yes, yourself. Yes, I am. I am beside myself because I feel it, Alice. He's lost to me as long as she's up there. Oh, I can stand here, out here under the trees, trying to reach him with every bit of soul I possess, but... As long as she's there, as long as she's alive, he'll never be mine again. Anne. Anne, this is terrible. You've got to pull yourself together and get some rest. You've been sitting in that chair now for three hours. Please, don't talk. Just let me alone. You're... You're working on that willpower thing still, aren't you, Anne? And it, it makes me awfully nervous. Be quiet. It's coming. Something's coming. Something's going to happen. I feel it all around. I'm going to get a doctor if you don't stop. I feel it. I feel something. You're just as white as a sheet. You're shaking all over. I absolutely refuse to let this go on. Do you hear? Now, you, you get into bed. No. Let me take off no, your... No, no, no. Leave me alone. It's as though there were a big lump being moved off my heart. As though the ice inside me were going. As though I, I could cry at last. Oh, it's happened. Oh, thank you, God. Thank you. All right. I'll lie down now. I'll go to sleep. If you could sleep, you'd feel better. If you just relax. I've done it, Alice. You'll see. He'll be here in the morning. Lie down now. There he is. Didn't I tell you? There's Clyde now. Hello? Yes. Yes, this is room 351. Yes, this is Ann Brody speaking. Yes. It's Riverdale calling. Riverdale. Clyde? She didn't say. Oh, hello. Yes. Yes, I'm Ann Brody. Why, yes, I'm a friend of Mr. Clyde Dexter. Who did you say this is, please? The, the police. The police. Oh, something hasn't happened to Mr. Dexter, has it? Oh. What? Yes. Yes, my friend and I were out to the house late this afternoon, around six o'clock. Well, yes, I, I did wear a white hat and a green dress, and, and she... W oh, but we took the subway, the White Plains Express, on the Interboro line from our hotel. We came back around seven. We, well, we just walked past the house two or three times, but... Well, what's the matter? Why are you asking me these questions? No, I haven't seen them. I... What? Give me the phone, Anne. Let me speak to them. You're in no condition Keep to... Away. Do... You know what they're saying? Do you? That Clyde's mother has been murdered. What? Oh, no. No, I haven't. Yes? No. No, we didn't. We just came right home. We didn't even ring the bell. Is Mr. Destica there with you? I see. Well, I'd like to speak to him, please, when he gets through. Will you ask him to call me? Yes. We'll stay here in the room. Oh, Anne. It was a hammer. At 8 o'clock tonight. She was struck from behind by an unknown assailant. Oh, how awful. Oh, 
Why did the police call us? What have we got to do with it? Clyde was home when we walked by the house. He saw us standing there. I'm going to tell him, Alice. I'm going to tell him the truth. Truth? What truth? There's always been that power inside me. I've known I had it, and sometimes it frightened me. Things have happened. I've been afraid sometimes to use it, afraid it would turn against me. And tonight it did turn against me. And what do you mean? By an unknown assailant. Murdered by an unknown assailant. You know who that assailant was? It was me. Anne, are you crazy? You you were up here in, in the room every minute. I was up here in the room, but I was wishing she were dead. I was willing him to come to me. I was trying to destroy the barrier. Oh, surely you can't believe that, Anne. It was, it was only a coincidence, a terrible coincidence. I was trying to bring him back, to touch his heart, but the power didn't touch his heart. His heart's like steel against me. It struck his heart and glanced off and struck her dead. Anne. Please, you're talking like a... You don't understand. People like you can understand. People like you... But there's violence to will. To store it up takes years. To send it out of yourself is like... Like sending a powerful hand with fingers. Will can't kill somebody, Anne. Not pure will. The body is one thing, the mind's another... Mrs. Dexter is physically dead. Her heart stopped beating. There was a blow. Somebody real, somebody human did that. She was struck from behind. She was alone in the house. They said the doors were locked. She had no enemies. It came out of nothing, and it went away again. Oh, I, I never dreamed. I didn't want it to happen that way, but... But it's getting beyond me. It's assuming forms and accomplishing ends I don't plan. It's, it's turning against me, Alice. Turning against me... Do you think a police court will believe you? You'll only confuse the testimony. You'll only hurt Clyde. And Will. Will, you talk about the power of your will. Did you have any real power these last two days? Did it bring Clyde to this hotel? Did it make him love you or even call you up? Yes. 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 Don't you touch me. I won't let you speak to him. Get away from that phone, Alice. Do you want to get us in trouble? Do you want us to go to jail and spend weeks in court? He'd put you there. He wouldn't care. Get away from that phone, Alice. I don't believe you, do you hear? I think you're mad. You're mad as a hatter. Get away from that phone. No! Anne, you'll ruin your life. You'll fall into suspicion, and people will always think you had something really to do with it. You'll, you'll end up in an asylum. The whole world will know he jilted you. What, what are you going to say to him? He must be half beside himself as it is. He'll, he'll never believe you. What? All right. Thank you, Alice. You see? It is there, isn't it? I made you do what I wanted. <laughs> and I can make anyone... Hello? Hello, Clyde. Oh, Clyde, darling, I just heard the terrible news. How terrible for you. I'm so sorry. Yes, Alice and I were out there this afternoon. We came by to say hello, but we got cold feet and came home. Oh, no, Clyde, no, we didn't, not a soul. Oh, yes, my darling, I, I understand how terribly broken up and... And my heart goes out to you. Oh, I will, Clyde, dearest. I will. I'll be right over. I'll help you in any way I know. Goodbye, Clyde. Anne. You didn't tell him. You're not going to tell him at all. No. Why should I? He's mine now. <laughs> Brody walked out of my life, walked from me wrapped in her new and terrible strangeness. Somehow I didn't want to play any part in her life again. I didn't go to her wedding when she and Clyde were married one year later. To me, there would have been something evil in hearing her voice repeat the sacred words. 
I am Take Thee, Clyde. There has been for me a nameless horror in the slow, steady way Anne Brody fulfilled her plans. The house in Riverdale, the car, the three children, Peter, Clyde Jr., and Charlotte. Her happiness, her triumphant motherhood has somehow been hideous to me. I've never heard a train whistle crying through the dawn but what I've thought of her and shuddered. I have been afraid of Anne Brody now for 15 years. Today, I know I've been a fool. Today, I know that it was a real murderer who murdered Mrs. Dexter with a hammer from the service porch. Today, I'm going on a journey to Riverdale. I am going to see Anne Brody again, lying willless and struck down in her coffin, lying innocent and pathetic, lying murdered. Not will, nor nameless monsters of the mind could save her from the truth at last. Yesterday afternoon, the weak, long, brooding creature who could not brook domination from mother or wife flung pent-up death against the mistress of his will. Yesterday afternoon, Clyde Dexter struck again. Presented by Roma Wine, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is Truman Bradley for Roma Wines with a tip on how to win praise and increase dining pleasure. Today, millions of clever homemakers are enjoying dinner table compliments by giving everyday dishes tempting new meal appeal. Here's the secret. A glass of red Roma California Burgundy at each place. Try it yourself. Serve robust Roma Burgundy with tomorrow night's piping hot savory pot roast, tender juicy steak, or baked fish. Roma Burgundy brings out tasty new flavorfulness from every morsel, wins grateful compliments for your cooking, and notice how the warm glowing redness of Roma Burgundy adds richness and beauty to your table. Yet, the gracious custom of serving Roma, America's favorite wine, is as inexpensive as it is delightful. Enjoy exciting new dining pleasure tomorrow with delicious Roma Burgundy. Insist on Roma, R-O-M-A, Roma Wine, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is Nancy Kelly. I'm sure you want to hear next Thursday's suspense when Joseph Cotton will star as a famous New York criminal lawyer in one of the best-known suspense stories of our time. Then Hex Crime Without Passion. Thank you. Nancy Kelly will soon be seen in the Paramount picture, Follow That Woman. Next Thursday, same time, Roma Wines will bring you Joseph Cotton as star of Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Produced by William Spear for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. Next week, part of the country goes on daylight saving time. If your area remains on standard time, tune in suspense one hour earlier. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.